Welcome again. Good to have you in worship, whether you are here in person or online. We continue our series, Fired Up, as we walk through the history of the early church in the book of Acts, which is also an encouragement for all of us, the early church and all of us, to be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit and to follow God in that way. So we are looking good news to all people this morning. We are in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 through 48. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled in us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also is written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As to his raising him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy promises made to David. Therefore, he has also said in another psalm, you will not let your holy one experience corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, died and was laid beside his ancestors and experienced corruption. But he whom God raised experienced no corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, my brothers and sisters, that through this man forgives us sins proclaimed to you. By this, Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from all those sins from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, that what the prophet said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, be amazed and perish, for in your days I'm doing a good work, a work that you will never believe, even if someone tells you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people urged them to speak about these things again the next Sabbath. When the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blasphemed. They contradicted what Paul spoke. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you. Since you rejected it and judged yourself to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord, as many as had been destined for eternal life became believers. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, I hope you're enjoying this series as we think about fired up in our own lives and uh, think about the power of the Holy Spirit. I have said and will continue to say that Pentecost isn't a day, it's a season and hopefully a season of all of our lives. And we've been walking through since the day of Pentecost, thinking about open up the windows of our lives, even as the disciples did that first time in the upper room, the first day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit swept through and filled them with fire and passion, and the word of God began to spread. And we looked about setting our own hearts on fire. We have walked through speaking about, uh, thinking about speaking with boldness as we share the good news of Christ we looked at Stephen, who was a young man, all in as the first deacon, and we thought about Paul, who was knocked off his horse as he was blinded by uh, the light and the voice of God, Jesus Christ himself. And then we looked at Peter, set free from prison at a table where all are welcome. This morning, we look at good news to everyone. I have uh, also challenged you, you recall, to think about three questions in your own life. What is your level of passion what is, what are, or the gift or gifts that you are willing to share, that God has given you to share? And then what is your level of resilience to overcome challenges and obstacles that are part of everyday life and certainly the life and the walk of faith? And so with that in mind, I invite you back into the story this morning. I want you to think for a moment about maybe the last time or a momentous moment in your life where you received good news. Can you think about it? Uh, I know recently, not that long ago, as Savannah is so excited about going to school <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> but I remember when we received the news from the universities, Savannah had applied to five, and we were just so full of anticipation and excitement, and then every time we received, of course, uh, a yes, it was like, it was, it was great. Someone had like these, it was like an email, and it popped up, it had this email confetti, and some of them actually sent you some confetti there, and she was all excited, and I was trying to read the fine print for the financial aid. <laughs> Seriously, man, I mean, you know, like, oh, that's a great scholarship. Oh, wait, whoa, what, look what's left after that. So 
And of course, she ended up going to Purdue. We're excited about that. So, uh, and, uh, and, it, and, and you kind of lose the initial excitement, I suppose, uh, as time goes on. And, and there's other moments in life that have been great. And, and just recently, my, I have to tell you, every time I've received a, a note, text, or a phone call from our young couples that they'd received a baby, a newborn baby, and the baby's in good health. So Maggie, Jay, and, and Matt with little Lee Matthew, right? And, and Michael and Gloria with uh, Logan, Ethan. And then this week with um, the vaults and little baby Flynn, just so exciting. But many times I like to go in and, and I always, you know, wash up and everything really close, but to be able to to hold the baby and to bless the baby there in the hospital and to celebrate with the parents. And then the baptisms, all, it's just so exciting. And uh, my heart is always thrilled about that. So what about you when you receive the good news? And I'd like you to hold that in the back of your mind to think about the message this morning as we see that Paul and Barnabas on the first, this is the first missionary journey, by the way. Oh, we're not, there we go. Hey, there's the first missionary journey. And, uh, wow, the first missionary journey. Turns out that God is a big fan of boats, like me. Hey, love that. So, <laughs> I love the ocean. I love boats. Many of you know. But uh, Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, you know, uh, and they took off, went to Cyprus. Then they went over to um, Antioch, where they are in this morning's reading. And, of course, they continued on after that and then circled back around. But they we're trying to spread the good news, not just to uh, the Israelite nation, but also to all people. Now, that wasn't a rejection of the Israelites. We're going to be very clear about that, right? Everybody, it's to everybody, and then you have a choice whether to accept or to reject. And, of course, Paul and Barnabas, wow. So the, what's their level of passion? And they are on fire, like all the early church. They're full of the Holy Spirit, their passion. And passion feeds on passion. So if your passion is down this morning, well, maybe you need to get excited about the new, good news of faith in Jesus Christ and what God has done and given to you. And then they had gifts to share. And those gifts are always developing. But if you wait for your gift to be fully developed in order to share it, guess what? You're not going to do anything. You're just going to sit in the pew or sit wherever you are, right? It doesn't matter whether it's faith or work, school, life, whatever it is, you have to develop your gift and talent. God has given you that raw gift and talent, but it's up to you to nurture it, help it to grow, and to be a blessing to others. And then Paul and Silas, what's their level of resilience? Man, we're going to see that they faced all kinds of things, but even here, what, they got people riding. You know, some people accepted the good news and some people rejected it. And you know what? That's not up to you. It's up to them. And it's up to God to develop it. But what is up to you is to share the good news. Be who you are when you do that, but share the good news. What has God done for you, right? And you're not trying to make them into your image, but you're trying to open them up to the image of God through the love of Christ. And that's so important that all that we do. So when you look at it this morning and you think about that, you think about Paul's boldness, which we talked about, and, and Barnabas's boldness here. But look at the level of passion. Man, you just can't hold it back, right? And Paul preaches this, this forgiveness of sins to everyone. You know, that's the boiled down version of it. And uh, some people excited, some people not so excited. Some cities are more excited, some cities are not so excited. Some places the persecution is bearable, and some places it's almost unbearable. But wow, and what's happened through the whole book of Acts? And it says the Acts of the Holy Spirit, but it's also the Acts of the Apostles through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that message continues to this day. And when Luke wrote this after his gospel, Luke wrote it to a generation that was sort of fading in their enthusiasm. You know, that first love was sort of fading uh, you ever seen a new believer there's just so on fire? Oh, man, it's just like, get, get up next to them. They may not have all the theology, you know, the experience, or whatever, but they have something special because they have passion. You know, it's like a, on fire, right? And, uh, and it's amazing. And then what's, you know, the gifts that you're sharing? And, and then, of course, we need resilience. And for all of us, we do tend to wane over time and need that constant encouragement through the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, I want to read that verse. Let me just read the heart of the matter, if you will. 
because we've done a whole series on Ephesians before. And I want you to hear this from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus and to us in 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand before to be our way of life. I'll read that again. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So what's the problem sometime with us? Well, I want to kind of put it this way, because I think this is really good. So, Ashley, thank you. Sometimes we get it backwards. And I, I like this that John Ortberg came up with, because many people throughout the history of the church have made this note, but I think he made it in a clear easier way than anyone else. And so I just want to walk through what it looks like this morning. And uh, he has the cycle of grace versus the cycle of works. And if you look at the cycle of grace, it begins with acceptance, okay, at the top. Acceptance, what is that? It means that, that God loves us, all right? God accepts us not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. God's love for us is there for us. And then from there, we move to what? Sustenance. What's sustenance? It's nurture. How do you sustain? All of us need to sustain our spiritual life, all of our lives, really, okay? So how do you you nurture that? Well, we find God's love is nurturing, God's word is nurturing, God's Holy Spirit is nurturing. And then we look at significance. What is significance? Significance. Significance is, is value, it's self-worth, who you are. And then finally, it's achievement. Because if we're significant because we are loved by God, and, and then we're set free to use our gifts and talents to just bless others, all right? But what happens when you turn it around, which so many people do if you've been in the church for a while? Well, let's take a look at it. Because the same elements are there, but the order is reversed. So you begin feeling unworthy. And so what do you do? You focus on achievement to feel worth. You obsess over achievement because you never feel worthy enough and you're never good enough. And then you find that you need significance, but it's not there because you never really have self-worth. You never really have that value that you need. And then you're all the time being hungry. You need nurture, but because you haven't achieved enough and, you know, you never have enough, and then acceptance never really comes. And it is the weight of that that will destroy the Christian life and any life. And for parents, I must say, this is so important for parents. Every day I tell my daughter that I love her, I'm proud of her, and she can tell you that. But we need it from our Heavenly Father. And you know, as parents, you need to do this. You need to set your kids free. You need to love them unconditionally, right? You need to be there to nurture them, and, and you need to be there and let them know they're valuable, they have worth. Set them free to achieve what it is that God has given them for their goals. But if you haven't discovered it from God, you're going to be a poor parent in trying to do that. But you can change anytime. But the first thing is discover what it is. And so what is the only thing that separates the cycle of grace from the cycle of works? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. Because when you depend on yourself and when you try to be worthy, when you try to make God love you through what you do, and it is a tiring, exhausting road, may I tell you, okay? But God in Jesus Christ, our creator, And his only son, his only child, come to us, showing us the way of love, telling us about the way of love, but more important, giving his life in the way of love and the greatest gift of love of all time. Because he loved us first, made all the difference to reconcile the world, love and justice, 
on which the foundations of the universe are founded. Today, as you look at your life, where are you? What cycle are you on? We all need those four things. And I'm not trying to beat anybody down, okay? I just want you to ask yourself this morning, where are you and what is the good news that you're sharing? Because I'm going to tell you something. The cycle works is not a message of good news. I don't care how much you accomplish, okay? Because it is a tiring, exhausting wheel that will never end and it will exhaust you. It will weigh you down. It will be a load of bricks that gets heavier and heavier and heavier by the day. But through the cross of Jesus Christ and the good news of God's love, you can be set free for the cycle of grace. You can hear the words that Paul preaches this morning and that are throughout Acts and all the Gospels, that God loves you unconditionally, that God has given his life that you would have life, that you would experience God's love that is from before the foundations of the world. And never mind that we've all fallen short, we've all sinned, we're all broken in some sense. God has loved us and God has pursued us from the very beginning of Genesis through the cross and into this moment to be reconciled to him and be reconciling people. God loves you and accepts you. And once you accept God's love, then you're set free in a whole new world. You will find nurture every day. Just lean into God's grace because it is a tiring, exhausting world out there. Life comes with plenty of challenge and adversity. So who are you going to lean on? Lean on Jesus. Lean on God's love. And then you'll find significance. You will find in that that you are worth everything, like a child loved of God. And then you're set free to use your gifts and talents, not to earn God's love, but in return for God's love. Not to earn God's love, but in return for God's love. And that makes all the difference. That makes all the difference. So today, what's the order of your life? What's the order of your mindset every day? Well, if it's not that, then I challenge you, write it down. Ask yourself every day, where are you? Fill in some scripture verses that are true to you, okay? Begin with John 3, 16, for number one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then find the nurture and be set free with your gifts and talents. God has blessed you to grow, to flourish, to bless other people. And that will make all the difference. There's a great athlete that I love, Sydney McLaughlin. You heard me mention her before. And uh, she just broke the world record uh, in the 400-meter hurdle. Man, that is like the hardest thing in track and field. Uh, you know, I have to run fast. You got to jump over all the hurdles without knocking them over. And she broke the world record, which uh, she set a world record in the Olympics. And then uh, she's been uh, Allison Felix's roommate and uh, co-champions and everything. And then the world record, of course, that she broke was her own world record, 50.68. It was her current record. She hasn't broken that. She's trying to get under 50, but she is phenomenal. And she says, according to her, I mean, man, she just shines with the radiance of Christ because she says that when she was growing up in high school and as a you know, track person, she says wasn't quite as good as some of the other gals or what she wanted to be, the really superstar. And so she always had to work harder, had to work harder. But then she discovered the love of Christ in a new way because she'd kind of grown up in a family of faith. But then she had a powerful experience when she was young and in high school. And she said she discovered that the first thing was that she was a child of God. And that set her free to be whoever she wanted to be. And when she did great, the fans love her. When she didn't do great, the fans didn't love her. But she rested in the fact that she's a child of God. And it set her free to work hard and just be all that she can be. And she shattered another world record. And uh, first thing she did was give glory to God. She knows the key, the key to life, that acceptance comes first that you are a son or daughter of God, that God loves you, reconciles you in Christ. I'm going to close with this thought because I have to mention it, which is the story of Mary and Martha. And I love that story of Mary and Martha. And Jesus loved both of those women. But you recall that 
Jesus was coming to Mary and Martha's home, and then, as today, they wanted everything to be just right. And Martha was busy preparing everything because there was so much to prepare. It was Jesus' disciples. I bet they ate. Man, can you imagine? I just know they ate a lot. <laughs> and so, but she's so frustrated. She's busy working so hard doing this. And, and Mary, her sister, is just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Listen to Jesus. We're kind of worshiping, just being centered on, on Jesus. And Martha just lets it go for a while. But then at one point, she just boils over to Jesus. And she says, Lord, please tell my sister to help me. And what did Jesus say in a very loving way? He said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the better. Now, listen, we all need people that do. Believe me. Believe me. As a pastor, I know that. We appreciate people who do. But Jesus was pointing out the order that needs to happen. Because you got to be before you do. I'll say that again. You got to be before you do. You got to be a child of God. You got to feel loved by God before you do, because otherwise you're going to feel just like Martha. You're going to be anxious and troubled about many things, and you're going to voice that on other people, right? You're going to lay guilt, lay all this stuff on other people, all your whatever stuff, baggage, whatever. Jesus says, Mary knows what's come first. One thing is needed. Sit at the feet of Jesus. Feel the love and grace of Almighty God that is there for you. And until and unless you do that, you won't really know what it's like to be set free from a child of God. So quit, you know, the rat race of life. Quit exhausting yourself. Be set free. Flip it around if you need to. Discover the first thing is acceptance the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then the sustenance that comes from being nurtured as a son or daughter of God. And then find significance of being valued just for that. And then be set free to use your gifts and talents, whatever they are, wherever you are, because God has a great future for you. And then it's, it's not trying to earn God's love. And if you're a parent, by gosh, write that down. We all need to do better, Right? Love your kids for who they are. Set them free to be them. Love them every day, just as God loves you. We join me in prayer. Lord, well, we forget about the good news sometimes because it just, we just get weighed down trying to be worth it. But we're already worthy because we're sons and daughters of you, our Lord and Savior. You loved us so much that you gave your life for us in Christ. So, Lord, help us to feel that love. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bind up our wounds, our brokenness, and would set us free from the guilt and sin and shame and chains of the past. And help us to realize that in your love that we are set free for the future, that we're sustained, we're valued, we're worthy, we're significant. And in all that, we can be set free to use our gifts and talents to bless others and to find fruitful fulfillment. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, say it like you mean it. Amen. amen.